I'm going to take in this presentation, I think this is a presentation that I've done before, and I'm not sure if I've done it uh, with our camera club or not. Uh, so there may be some things in here that you may have seen in the past, but I figured there's so many new, uh, there's new, so many new members that maybe it's not so bad showing it again. But I'm going to take you down a couple of tracks here. Uh, light camera action is, is one track and, uh, and also the, uh, ingredients for the, my five main ingredients for a good photo. When we're talking about lights, I think we're all familiar with, with these. And natural light, of course, is, is what we're, most of us use. And existing artificial you know, fill flash and high-speed sync, and then second curtain flash. I use most of these. I very rarely use a second curtain flash, but it's, it's available in case you have a situation at, at night where you want to get a, a dark background to be lighter and then also illuminate your subject that would be closer to you. And I'll explain some of those as we go through. I'm gonna show you some examples. But combining uh, this presentation with uh, one of my older presentations, in my opinion, this is important. These are the five ingredients to a great photo. And we're gonna go through some of these images as uh, I'm gonna talk about some of this uh, as we go through some of my images. Sometimes the light is the subject. Most of you know me as a wildlife photographer. And in this case here, this I'm using natural light and our subjects are being illuminated by natural light. And this particular bird here is the first bird that I saw when I started getting into uh, photography. I used to own a business and I, I would leave the office to just take a break and I'd walk around a retention pond. And I saw one of these little birds at my feet and I thought, oh man, that's a, I couldn't believe it. It was a raccoon eye bird. And my son's a biologist. So I, I called him. I said, there's a bird that's got like a raccoon face. And he goes, dad, that's a, that's a, uh, that's a warbler. And uh, he said, it's a common yellow throat. And he said, look, so he sent me, he sent me my first Sibley's uh, bird identification book. That's what really got me into warblers. Now I'm going to go through some of these images here and, uh, all of them are warblers except for one. So when you see the bird that comes up that's not a warbler, go ahead and shout out and, and say that that's not a warbler. You can also Jack, say what it is if you know. Jack, all we're seeing <laughs> yeah. is your lights, camera, action, which I think is your background. We're not seeing the actual slides. We're just seeing that original yeah. shrimp boat. Oh, you haven't seen any of these slides yet? No. You need to share your screen, Jack. Oh, God. All right. Are you coming back? Nope. Are, are you seeing the, the second slide now? No, no. No, no I still see the front boat. If you click on the share screen at the bottom, then you should see several programs come up. One of them will be your slideshow. Click on that one. Well. Okay. Yeah, the bedrooms and closets cleaned up so we can start bringing our clothes over. I don't know, people. Doesn't seem to be working. Oh, there we go. There you Is go. Everybody seeing that one now? Yes. All right. Well, I'm going to go this route. <laughs> so I'll start again. This is this, this particular program, I'm going to take it down uh, two tracks. Uh, one of them, I'm going to talk about light camera action. And the other one's going to be about my, uh, my uh, ingredients to a better photo. In some cases, the light is a subject. 
these are, this is what you're seeing as far as the light that we all work with. And I'm gonna show examples of some of these uh, light situations. And I'm also gonna talk about the five ingredients to a great photo. And in my opinion, these, this is what we need to follow, or this is what I always follow as far as uh, preparing for an, a particular image. Sometimes the light is the subject. I'm gonna be showing a lot of images in this, in this program, guys. And here's the bird I was talking about. It's a common yellow throat warbler. And it's the first bird that I ever saw. And it's just a, a beautiful little guy. Now I'm gonna go through a bunch of these. They're all warblers except for one. So whenever, whenever the bird pops up that's not a warbler, say so. This is the female to the, uh, to the common yellow throat. And again, when I'm going through these images, uh, pay a little attention to, to my, uh, my ingredients. I think I, I incorporate those ingredients in all my images, at least I try to. Yeah. And I try to get in close enough to get uh, feather detail, which is really important to me. Now this one I just took in, over in Dutton here in Atlantic Beach. I was so happy to see this little guy over there. That's the male, that's the female. That's the female, male, female. Now this particular shot is different. All those other photos were, were done in natural light. This one here is an, uh, was taken with a flash, high speed sync. It's taken in bright sunlight and without using the flash, and of course I have the better beamer on it because you know, the bird's a little bit of a distance away. Uh, you get this shot here. It's a very, very high speed shot with flash incorporated into it. And you get a really nice image. You get really nice lighting. It doesn't look like it was taken in, in broad midday sunlight. You don't get those hard, harsh shadows. So the flash really works for this type of a, an image. This one also taken the same way, taken in broad, taken midday sun. Uh, and it's really pleasing, uh, pleasing tones and uh, the lighting's quite nice. It's also taken with a high speed sync. And by the way, I took this one over at uh, Sweetwater. I'm going to talk about my bird bath in the backyard of my house. These, this particular warbler does not, they don't eat seeds, they're bug eaters. So the only way to attract them is, is by using water and, and a water drip. I'm a little disappointed. I, I passed the bird that's not a warbler. Nobody said anything. Does anybody, can anybody identify the bird in this series that wasn't a warbler? Was it a Baltimore Oriole? No. <laughs> black bean, black wing, red wing blackbird? No. No? Okay. Was it the American Red Start? Did you have one? No. There? That's a warbler. Okay. Okay. All right, I'm going to go. I'm going to go back, just to give you a little, a little clue.
Bam. Oh. <laughs> Never saw him. That's an American goldfinch. Hey, Jack, can you talk to us more about the Better Beamer? The Better Beamer is a, a piece of plastic with a friends of lens on the end. It extends the lens out from the flash about six to eight inches. It attaches to any flash, uh, any flash that you, you might have. And what it does is it just it just uh, magnifies the the beam out to about thirty to forty feet, and you can get really good images uh, with that. I mean, it, it just projects the flash beam out. 30 or 40 feet. That's just what it does. So, Jack, have you found it to work better with one lens versus another? No, it's, uh, it's, just, it's just the light. It's just the flash. It's just an assistant to your flash uh, unit. And, uh, you know, naturally, if you're using it, you're probably using a longer lens to begin with. Uh, I mean, I don't use it if I'm using a, a short lens, I'm not using a better beamer because my subject's going to be close to me. Uh, when I'm using a 300 or above, then and I'm going to be using a flash, then I always put the better beamer on because I am, I'm going to anticipate that my subject is going to be 30 or 40 or 50 feet away, and I want that extra push from my flash unit. What lens are you using? I'm using a 300 28 in most cases in most all cases. There's some images on, in here that will be a 400 to eight and a 500 F4, but just about, and I think every one of these uh, warblers that I just showed you were taken with a 300 to eight and several of them were taken from my, from my kayak actually. Hey Jack, do you use a prime yeah. lens most of the time when you're uh, photographing birds then? Do you favor prime like, lenses? My prime is a, a 300-2.8, and my camera is a, is a Canon 7D, which is a crop lens, is, is a crop uh, sensor. So I'm, a, I'm at 404 plus uh, with my uh, particular uh, lens. And Jack, do you use any special kind of flash? Because the flash I have will just go back to being 200. Um, I mean, I can't have a shutter speed higher than 200. And you said you do a high speed. Yeah. Uh, your higher end flashes will, will enable a high speed sync or second curtain flash. Uh, I have secondary flashes that I use in case something breaks uh, that really, that, that won't accomplish that, that won't accommodate uh, those settings. So I use a, a, a 580 EX, a Canon, it's, it's, you know, it's a five or six hundred dollar flash uh, as my primary I, flash. Jack, and I, think she, I think she actually had, had a slightly different question. Um, OK, so the issue is all cameras, Canon, Nikon, etc. With a standard flash will only allow you to get to one two fiftieth of a second. So that's the rule. So one of the things that Jack uses to overcome that, to get a faster shutter speed, is his high-speed sync flash. But all right. the good flashes, like he's talking about, have this high-speed sync flash capability. But you have to turn it on. So Jack, that was kind of the question. Could you take it from there? Sorry. Well, does that answer, does that answer the question? I'm yes, it does. Thank you. I think it does. I'll I'm going to look at my. I'm going to check out my flash and see if I yeah. have high speed. Oh, okay. With the standard, with a standard flash and a standard camera, yeah. you cannot go above one two fiftieth of a second. Right. That's the rule. But so, with the flash, okay. Well, I mean, when, you, when you're using this flash, it, you're shooting manual. You have to shoot manual. You're not going to be able. Okay. If you're if you're going to try to do high speed sync, you have to have a flash unit that will accommodate high speed sync. If you're going to do that, then you have to you have to set your camera in manual mode. You're going to override your 60, 160th or 1 250th of a second. You can't, you have to be in manual. And it's still, when I'm manual, it still sync, goes to 250. So it, I'll, work if, uh, I'll work on it. I'll work on it. 
There's a, I think the flash, when you put your flash on, your camera should sense the flash and the camera, at least my camera, senses that I'm putting on high speed sync mode in my flash and then my camera automatically says, okay, go to manual and then I can change it. I can change my shutter speed to whatever I want because in high speed sync, your shutter speed is gonna be probably one one thousandth or one two thousandth of a second. So you have to get away from the, uh, the standard mode. And I don't think that, in fact, I know you don't have to go into your um, menu to change that. Your, the flash should tell your camera that you want to go to high speed sync and it should enable your camera to change the shutter speed when you go into manual mode. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I'm looking at my picture on here. Is Mary Zevis under my name, under my picture in your, are you guys seeing my picture and it says Mary Zevis under it? Uh, that is correct. Yes, that is no. correct. Yes. Okay. Every picture I've ever seen of Mary, she wasn't bald. <laughs> oh, thanks, Jean. <laughs> that was really sweet. <laughs> She is not. <laughs> I'm on my wife's. I'm on my wife's computer now, so I really don't know what I'm doing with it. So, uh, but actually, we're getting this thing going. So, except for the wise crack from Eugene, we'll go a little bit. We'll go back into my program. <laughs> okay, that was sweet. I'm going the wrong way. The wrong way. It's trying to catch up. Bear with me for a second, or bear with my computer. Jack, as you're going through there, how many of those warblers are you getting up in Maine and how many are you getting here? Which ones, any comment? I'm getting quite a few here. I, I get, I get uh, some of them, well, I get a lot of the same ones here because this time of the year, and I was gonna talk about that, that this time of the year, we're seeing a lot of uh, warblers heading north and I get them stopping by my backyard here in Atlantic Beach, which, which is really special. Then I see the same ones up in Maine. But for the most part. How many of these were taken with flash jack? Pardon me? Hang on a minute. How many of these were taken most with flash jack? The two I showed you that I talked about were the only two that were shot with a flash. I, I used oh, a high-speed okay. sync on those. This is what my backyard looks like. I get painted bunnings because I have a bird feeder with a cage around it that prevents bigger birds from getting in there. And I use a white millet that I get from Wild Birds Unlimited. It's just for white millet. and. I get lots and lots of buntings and they're beautiful. And for the, the birds that are bug eaters, I have a, a bird bath and above the bird bath, I have perches uh, constructed and running up that perch, I have a small piece of tubing, which hooks up to my faucet off the house. So I have uh, with a little uh, uh, needle valve, I have a, a slow drip. So there's a constant drip so that the water's steadily being agitated and that attracts when birds are flying over the canopy and they look down and they see that that shimmering water uh, they come right down for a drink and that that's the way i i'm able to attract a lot of birds that are heading north into my backyard and i've gotten lots of different birds that typically aren't here that i see in maine that, that are coming by now these guys are here all winter long now they used to they used to go down Florida and uh, Cuba, but now with the changing climate, they winter here in 
Atlantic Beach and in uh, North Florida. They go north into the Carolinas to nest in the summertime. But they're here all winter long, and they're going to be here until about uh, the first week or second week of June. And these are painted bunnings. That's a male painted bunning. And the female painted bunning is also really beautiful. And the reason I'm getting these shots, these are perches that are, can, that are mounted off of my bird feeder. So, and right before this, before the program tonight, I went into the bedroom, I looked out, I had a, I had a whole bird bath full of painted bunnings. It was really something special. Um, thank you, sir. That's a female. Here is a, a male, and he's, he's in the process of becoming a, a, uh, an adult. That's a juvenile. The juvenile male painted bunnings look like females. But he's, you can see the, the blue uh, feathers starting to come in and the red breast starting to develop. I just, I'm always fascinated about this, <laughs> the, way they, the way they bathe. Now, talking about light, Again, this is this bird was sitting still in a, in a right out of my window, and I put my camera up to the window. Now I'm shooting through a tinted uh, thermopane sliding glass door, and I have done this before, and I'm getting really nice effects, really nice tones, and I'm still getting very very little uh, loss of detail, but this was taken through the sliding glass door, through the glass, and same with this. So I don't know, I'm, I'm beginning to think I need to carry a piece of my sliding glass door around with me and use it as a filter. It's really quite pleasing, I think. Jack, those um, uh, perches that you have on your uh, bird feeders, are you just wiring uh, wood limbs onto it? Yeah, wire ties. Wire ties, interesting. Wire ties. I, all the trees around my house here are the scrub oaks and they just keep dropping branches with all the algae uh, on them. And I'll take fresh branches and I'll, I'll wire tie them to my bird feeder. And, and then I, I go in there and I set them so I have good backgrounds. I place them properly so that I'm gonna get uh, a good clear background. I try to get my I try to have a lot of distance behind it. So once I, I get them in, in position, I come back and I look and I readjust them so that there's no limbs or palm fronds directly behind it. So I get a good clean background. And this is the result. The cardinal lands on it. That's, I've got a good background because there's nothing right directly behind them. It's important if you want to get good, a good background. Do you have a, a blind that you're behind inside your house or are you just no, in the window? No, usually what I'll do is I'll open the sliding glass door and I'll I set my tripod up and the bird feeder is about, I'd say 15 or 20 feet away from uh, my, my door. And the birds will come and they'll look in at me sometimes and a lot of times it takes a few minutes for them to get comfortable. Once they're, once they come in and they see that I'm there, they'll stand back for a few minutes and all of a sudden they get in and they start feeding and I start clicking away. And, uh, as long as, you know, and it works out really well. I mean, they, they see me. So I'm shooting with a sliding glass door open and I'm standing in the bedroom with my bird feeder just a little ways away. This is a guy you may see is a scarlet tanager. He came by, you know, usually have them, they, they come by in the spring. They're also bug eaters, so they come for the war. So Jack, you have a pretty stationary spot that you, um, that you photograph your birds from. Right. Would you repeat that question? This is what I consider. Yeah, I, what I was saying was. Go ahead. You have a pretty station. You have a pretty stationary spot where you, you uh, photograph your birds from. Oh yeah, yeah. 
when I'm in the bed, when I'm in our bedroom, I'm shooting on top of a tripod. So I'm stationary and I'm, and I'm waiting for the birds to come into my field of, of vision, uh, go, heading to the, heading for a bath or a drink or heading for some, for some seeds. So yeah, it's stationary. So are most, of these, are most of these off a tripod, Jack? All, yeah, all the ones are, yeah, from my bedroom. The painted bunnies are all off the tripod. They don't have to be. It's just that I don't want to stand there holding my camera for a long period of time because they seem to come and go in, in groups. And when they, when they come, and my camera's kind of heavy, so sitting it on a tripod while I'm waiting is, is a lot nicer. When I'm in the field, I very rarely, I'm, I'm always hand carrying. Uh, that, the shot I took of, the, uh, of that warbler that I told you about at Dutton, I'm not carrying a tripod through, through uh, Dutton or when I go out on hikes, I'm carrying my, just my camera. Very rarely will I carry a tripod unless, uh, unless the lighting conditions are poor. So are you, when you're in your bedroom shooting out the sliding glass window, are you using a remote? No. He's behind a tripod. Just standing there. I'm just standing right there and the birds, birds come and they look at me and pose sometimes. I know what they're doing. They're looking at you and saying, I wonder what happened to Ian. <laughs> Jack, are you calling many of these in like a tanager? Do you use a bird call to get them in? No, no, not at all. I'm just using the, I'm using the, the feed as a, the feed in the water as a tractor. This is, in my opinion, a bad background. I mean, I love Baltimore Orioles and I don't have a good Baltimore Oriole. I, I took this particular shot in Texas. Uh, and this, in my opinion, is a bad background. I hate this background. And I thought I'd, I don't have any really good Baltimore Oriole pictures with a good background, so I'm keeping it for now. Here's a juvenile Baltimore Oriole that I got off my back porch here at my house. This is the indigo bunting, and for those of you that are feeding birds and do have painted bunnings. These guys are going to be here within this week or the next week. All of a sudden, we're going to have a whole slew of, of these beautiful blue indigo buntings coming through Atlantic Beach or coming up the coast. This is the time of the year you need to be on the lookout for these indigo buntings. They're beautiful. They'll go all the way to Maine. I'll see these in the, in the summertime. But I've taken these shots all at my back in my backyard. This is what I carry. I haven't gotten the, the I haven't gotten the uh, R5 yet. I'm still using the Canon 7D. No, not the Canon 7D one. All my stuff is old, uh, but it works. It works well. And uh, this is what basically is in my camera bag. Now, a lot of you know that I went on a trip up to Minnesota with uh, Dick Vontano, and I had the opportunity to use the R5 with a, with a uh, Canon 400-2A, uh, and all these shots were taken with the R5. What a difference. And, and I'll tell you that when I'm shooting with my 7D, my 7D just does not like high ISOs. I cannot shoot high ISOs. Above 400, um, images are bad. So I shoot differently with the 7D and I, I'll set it at, I, a lot of times I'll shoot at aperture priority and I like to shoot manually most, most of the time, but if the lighting is changing, then I go to aperture priority and I always set my ISO at 400 or if I have really good light, 200. Uh, but I never, on a very rare occasion, will I go above 400. If I go to 640, then then I had to. And then I know that I've got to do work to uh, correct uh, some, of the, uh, some of the noise that I'm going to have. But with the R5, it's unbelievable. I was shooting it at ISO 2000. I was shooting at ISO 5000. And the images were good. Yeah. When, we were 
when we were driving up there, I'm, I'm picturing this image right here. I wanted to see a great gray owl in the forest with a good background, standing on a perch and have snow. And uh, got it. So, so Jack, this was with the R5? This, yeah, I used the R5 the whole time. Uh, uh, I don't know if some of you know, uh, y'all know Dick mostly, and, and he has a good friend named Jeff. And Jeff said, Jack, you're going up there to take my R5 and my 400 28. I was flabbergasted. I, I said, yeah, I'd love to do that. He lent me his camera for, for that whole week or week and a half trip that we had up there. So I never took my camera out of the bag. I love the R5. And one of these days, I'm going to have one. And Jack, do you all... always do 2.8? Or do you, when you have the 400 2.8, you leave it at 2.8? No, it depends on the subject. Uh, in this particular, and it depends on the distance. Now, the farther away the subject is, the lower you can go with your, with your uh, shutter, with your uh, f-stop, and, uh, and still get good coverage. Uh, I was shooting probably at 2.8 with these because the birds were a good distance. And, you know, the R5 has, has a high pixel. So I'm able to enlarge and still without losing any detail. So the lighting was poor. So I was using 2.8 and I was using a high ISO here. And with the R5, like I said, with, with my camera, I'm, I'm shooting mostly aperture priority. But with the R5, I'm shooting always manual and I'm adjusting the ISO to, uh, to bring the light up. I'll set my f-stop and I'll set my shutter speed. And then I use the dial on the back and that dial is changing the ISO. I don't have, with the R5, you don't have to worry about the noise uh, overtaking your picture. It's just, it's just a wonderful camera. So I shoot completely different with, the, uh, with that particular camera. Always manual, I would never shoot aperture priority with, with the R5 as I do with my Canon 7D. Now, full disclosure here, I love these birds with snow. And I got this guy, he was pretty close. I got this shot, thought it was kind of fun, but I thought it missed something. So I added the snow in post-processing. There's the original. And there's the snow. I did it manually. It's really easy. I just copied, sort of saw the way it looked, and I went ahead and put the snow in. Instant snowflakes. So Jack, these are also with the same R5 camera? Yes, yes. These are all these are all taken with the uh, R5. Like I said, I didn't take my camera out of the bag the whole trip. They drop down in the snow to try to catch the balls, and I he 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 think he was trying to get oh internet. He's trying to get dinner. There's another shot of him up in the up in the tree. All that snow is real. Jack, did you shoot the R5 in crop mode or full frame? It's full, full frame. frame. It doesn't do crop. Yeah. Oh, full frame. Okay. Okay. I was shooting it in full frame because it's uh and I, I and I and I had to wonder about why would anybody shoot uh, that particular camera in crop because mm. the pixels are so high and we had good lenses to begin with. But in full frame, you're going to get, you're going to have no impact from high noise uh, with high, high ISOs. And the reason my camera is not good with ISO is because it's a cropped camera. Uh, even the, the, like the, uh, the newer, I mean, the older uh, cameras that are full frame, they do way better with, with noise, but not, the, uh, not a crop camera. So I shot in full frame, and I, I can't think of any reason why anybody would switch over to, to crop with that particular camera. When it does have the capability. Any more distance? Yeah. yeah. I shoot my Sony, and I switch between crop and full, depending on the, 
distance using a prime 400? Well, well, I didn't. And that's interesting. I, I didn't have to. Uh, the images that I was that I was getting with the distances that we had, I, I think most of the subjects were probably a uh, hundred yards or maybe 150 yards at the most. Uh, I did a, a couple times put uh, a 1.4 on. I never put on the two. I oh, no, I did. I used the two X once or twice, but I had the 1.4 on a few times. And there were certain areas where we, where we knew the subjects were going to be 150 yards plus. So at that point, instead of going with the, the crop feature, and I got to tell you, I mean, it wasn't my camera, so I really wasn't sure how to switch back and forth. Uh, I, I'm not, I wasn't familiar with the camera, so I had it set in full frame, and that's where I was going to leave it. So for me, it was easier just to go ahead and put on the 1.4 uh, teleconverter and, and stay with it as is. A question to you and others who use, um, who set their cameras on crop. When you do that, aren't you, isn't it the same thing as cropping the picture in post-processing? Yes, Gene, this is Sean. The answer is yes. So if you do it in camera, you just get to see a bigger image so you can see what you're seeing. But the net, the net image on the sensor is the same. So in Jack's case, he is doing that zooming in afterwards. If you are not certain of the image, and you wanted to kind of get a better peek at it in camera, then you would do it. So it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. The, the net effect is zero. You're either cropping in the camera so you can see it, or you're cropping afterwards. And it, it's a judgment call. Um, yeah. So you're saying if we were, in, if you're in crop mode with that particular camera, it would have uh, no effect on the noise level of the ISO. No, you're all okay. the, electronically doing is what you did in post-process, Jack. So okay. uh, the advantage is if you're a hundred yards away, you get to see a bigger image on the screen. So you can try to decide, am I in focus, et cetera, but it's a judgment call. So uh, I'm kind of with you, just take it, uh, you know, take it and, and see what you can get later. But I can certainly see if you're uncertain about is it really in focus, etc. Am I very far away? Blowing it up on the screen, which is what you're doing in camera right. in camera crop. But the net effect, pixels are pixels. So you're either cropping okay. in the pixels there before or after. Well, I was nervous about the, the crop being in crop mode and, and having uh, having it affect my high ISO. So mm -hmm. in any case, they all turned out well. Those are great shots. The owls are beautiful, Jack. Well done. On the uh, Sony, I can find that I can also take a few more frames per second if I crop it because, because it's writing faster. Yes, that is a big, a big advantage, right? Yeah. I don't know how, how much faster this R5 can shoot. I mean, you hit the button and it shoots five frames instantly. It's, it's just, it's incredible. It's absolutely an incredible camera. Yeah. Okay. My wife always says, Jack, you're always taking pictures of animals and stuff. How about taking some people pictures? So one day we were heading out, we were walking along the lake to get in the car. We we're up in Maine. We we're going to go out. It's October. And I said, okay, Pose for me. She stood there and smiled. I took the shot. Had a good background. The lake was in the background. So we were heading out, and that's a picture of my wife. She's got good background. And she is a big part of, of what I do. She walks behind me when I'm prop, uh, working on pictures. She says, oh, look at that, that up there. That's, that's good. That's not good. Uh, so she helps me out a lot times and in this particular case here we were driving down route 180 in maine and she and i've heard her say this so many times oh jack you got to go back oh jack you got to go back she'll see something and then i'll go down and i'll turn around and i'll go back and this is one of those cases and it was a it was a beautiful spot i mean the, the lighting was really rough so i had to do some post work with this with shadows and highlights and so forth but it turned out to be beautiful and that's a that's a and you, 
you've seen these before, uh, Sean, when you were up there. That's down, that's a blueberry field in the foreground and then the forest in the background. It's just gorgeous, Jack. Well done. So many times I stop and I'm going to take a picture of something that I saw. Yeah, this is going slow. Mm. I took, a, I stopped at a railroad and I pulled into an area off the side of the road and I looked out the front of the window. I said, oh, forget the railroad. This is more, this is beautiful. So I took this shot, worked out well. And uh, we were out one day all over the place in the fall up there. It's just, it's just the, it's just magical. The colors are just wonderful. So my wife and I were out, spent the day uh, taking fall images all over the place, went out to Mount Desert Island. I came home and it was in the evening, sun was setting, <clears throat> and I looked out to the dock and I thought, oh man, look at that. So I took that shot and it's, it was my favorite shot of the whole day. That's our, that's our dock off our, our lake up in Maine. Jack, when is fall up there? First and second week of October. You oh, can, October. Okay. October first and second week, and uh, that's around. That's when most people say is the peak. And but you know what? A week or two ahead of that, or a week or two behind it, you'll still find clusters of areas where there are certain trees. I mean, in in uh, August and September, uh, the swamp maples they start changing. They'll be red in in uh, September, early September, and they'll be bare by the time October gets there. So trees uh, change at different rates, but uh, for the most part, the, the peak season is first and second week of October. All right. Jack, maybe this year we should organize a little trip uh, up there and, and go up to your your favorite place um, um, up in the, the north. You're all we're, welcome. All, we're all tired of being stuck at home. We need to get back to a beautiful <laughs> place like Maine. <laughs> You're all welcome. We love Maine. My wife also tells me a lot of times, she's, oh, Jack, yeah, that's a great picture. Yeah, just, that's just another eagle picture. Just another eagle picture. <laughs> she said, it's a really good picture, and I'm sure your photographer friends would, would, would like it and everything, but I wouldn't hang it on my wall. And she said, if you wanted to get it printed, maybe you can hang it in a garage or something. <laughs> so, <laughs> so a lot of times I go out and I start thinking, well, what would Mary Lou hang? What, what can I shoot that she'll hang on the wall? And we have a lot of images in the house. So I've been a little bit successful with that, but this is sort of a, you know, it, it's just a, a, a bright image of birches. And I thought it was kind of nice. This was taken at the park. Uh, if you guys are coming out there January, uh, I mean, April 16th. There's another fall in Maine. That's that's a uh, Acadia National Park. I was out in my kayak to shoot loons, and the mist was just lifting, and the, it was so still. It was just a beautiful reflection off the coast here in Jacksonville. When I get up in the morning, I look out over the ocean. And I think, oh. It's going to be a beautiful sunrise, or maybe it's not. So I'm so lucky to be here where I can run out the, out the back door and go down onto the beach and, and get an early morning shot. Now, this, this is probably the most vibrant red I've, I've seen in years. I took this several years ago. You can see a couple of the shrimp boats out there, but it was just absolutely magnificent. Acadian National Park. If, if you guys get a chance to go out to Santa Fe, uh, go to Ghost Ranch. That's what this is. The 
topography out there is just unbelievable. Natural light, artificial light. Artificial light. If you're shooting weddings, they don't like it to flash. This was an ISO 640. And I did have to do a little work to remove some of the... Of the uh... Now, when I'm shooting outside, if I'm doing uh, families or something like that, I always use fill flash. And every one of my images uh, with people like this are, are fill flash. So that's fill flash. And you can get, you can get up inside... Uh, the hood there, and uh, you can get that nice uh, reflection off the eye. That's light. That's mounted on the camera. Pardon me? That's mounted on the camera, the fill flash? It's, no, it's an attached flash. It's my uh, Canon uh, EX580. I'm, I, I don't think I've, very rarely, only when I've got, got caught, I've ever used the attached flash i think i've used it maybe a dozen times at the most i so very I, rarely I, I i did i spoke incorrectly the flash is mounted on the camera though it's not it's an attached flash but you don't have it mounted on a bracket or something yes it's attached on the camera i've and i don't know uh i had a bracket before uh i very rarely i don't get red eye for some reason the the flash attached to my camera gives me a good shot i don't get red eye on some occasions with owls at night, I will, with an owl at night, I will get red eye. Uh, even with the flash being on a bracket. When I'm shooting wildlife at night, I use my bracket, but it doesn't seem to help the red eye situation. So m in most cases, I have to rebuild the eye uh, when I'm taking uh, uh, birds at night. This bird was taken during midday high speed sink. So I'm sorry, Jack, if I could just take you back just a little bit to the portraitures. Uh, so you're saying that was uh, fill flash. Uh, that's a single flash. Yes, it's a fill flash. If I, I'm going to be sh uh, shooting manual, but I'm also probably going to be shooting at 250. And I'm probably going to use and it depends on the situation. But in most cases, I'm using uh, uh, the lowest setting. Uh, exposure compensation at a minus three with a fill flash. I don't want, I, I don't want to lose that natural look. I want to get a little bit of light, but I don't want to get that flash look on the face. So uh, fill flash, I guess I would define fill flash as a minus three exposure compensation setting on, on a regular flash. Sometimes I've used filters, but I really don't see a big difference with those. I'm just, I'm just fine using uh, the lower, the lower uh, power. So are you saying you set the flash to the minus three or the, or the camera to the minus three, Jack? Set the uh, flash to minus three. Oh, okay. I can adjust, you can adjust the power on your flash. Even the uh, less expensive yeah. flashes, you can adjust the actual output power on your flash. Yeah. And I always have mine uh, set all the way down. These are all high speed sync. Oh. Here's a good example of harsh lighting. It's too far away for me to use a flash. And this is way out in the woods. Uh, so I wasn't carrying extra gear. Uh, but it's a, it's a good example of, of a bad image because of bad lighting or harsh lighting. I like to play with long exposures. And in this particular case, I saw, and a lot of times I copy other people's work. I look at images all the time on 500 PX and others to see, to get different ideas. And I guess in a way I'm copying the work of other people. I, I'm not embarrassed to say that. But I saw an image where a, a wave was, was splashing up against the rocks and you can see the all little streaks coming up. And I thought that was pretty cool. So the next time I, I made it out to the coast in Maine, uh, I played around. This is a one eighth of a second to get that particular uh, effect with the waves splashing off of, of the rocks. 
I woke up one night and I looked out over the lake and the moon was so bright. I thought, man, that's pretty neat. I got my camera, I stuck it up to the window and I took this shot. It's a 30 second shot. It's just camera up against the window, 30 seconds. And I thought, wow, how about that? It snowed and I didn't realize if you look down on the ground, there's a lot of animals that are walking through my yard at night. But I never saw, the, the water was so blue and beautiful. 30 second shot, middle 3 a.m. in the morning with moonlight only. Long exposure here, the, the clouds were moving so fast that I took the shot and it gives the clouds a, a really neat effect. Long exposure here, I didn't have very good wave action because I wanted to get a real, real soft area along the, the shoreline. Uh, there was some wave action. So this is Boulder Beach up at uh, Acadia National Park on Mount Desert Island. Getting out there, you know, you, you look at this and think, oh, I'm just going to walk out there. Treacherous. The, the, all the rocks are wet. It's like trying to walk on bowling balls. And uh, I almost had to crawl out there, but I needed to get into a position you know, you got to get the shot. So you're trying to do whatever you can do to get the shot. So I'm crawling out there and got in position to get this shot. And I, I thought it was kind of cool. I wish I had uh, more wave action so I could have a, a, a softer uh, shoreline, but the best I could get. At the back of our cabin up there, this is the stream that feeds into the, into our lake. And with a slow, it's really dark. In the forest in Maine, in bright sunlight, it's pretty dark. Uh, set up with a tripod and I took this shot and I thought it was really cool with the, the foam coming down, it, it streaks through the water. So that, that's a nice effect if you're in a, a dark area and you have water flowing through. Okay, give me a minute. Whenever I'm around water, I slow it down. All you guys have done this work before. Slowing it down. Every time a moose, every time a moose puts his head down in the water, they feed on aquatic plants in the in the lake. And every, every two or three times that they stick their head down in the water, they shake their head. And I thought, oh, man, I, if, I, if I set this up and, and get a nice slow shutter speed, I'm going to get all the water streaking off of them. So that's what I did. In this particular case, I'm using a 10-stop a uh, filter. I, I bought a... Uh, uh, an ice filter, and it's a it's a ten stop neutral density filter. Went out to Mayport, got this shot. I really wanted the river to be smooth, so that's what I did. I use topaz. I use when I take a shot. I bring it home, I load it into uh, Lightroom, I do a little bit of work as far as exposure if I have to, then I ship it over to Photoshop, and in Photoshop I have Toto Topaz plugins, and just about every image that I take over to Photoshop, I'll go into Topaz, sometimes the images are a little bit too sharp, and I'll use, uh, I'll use Clean and I'll go into clean and I'll use the smoothing uh, filter just to take the, the sharp presentation is a lot nicer. At least I like it better when it's not so sharp, when it's a little bit smoother and it looks a little bit uh, more, a little bit like a painting, not, not so much, but smoother, not awfully sharp edges.
this particular shot was taken with my iPhone. I'm in my kayak. I've got a big lens and a camera between my legs. And I'm looking over the side of my kayak and here's this, this beautiful pond lily. So I got my iPhone out. I leaned, held it over the side of the kayak. I took that shot. So sometimes you have to make do with what you have. This is one of my best sellers. A lot of people disrespect the background. It's so important. I'm, a lot of times, I, I, not a lot of times, a few times I've been asked to judge uh, photo contests and, and it, almost every image you see, people don't pay attention to the background. The background is so important. Uh, I'm just a little funny about it. everything. I, I'm always looking at backgrounds. <clears throat> you know, lighting's important. Yeah, and the subject's important. All that's important. But a bad background can really ruin an image. And I showed you a couple of examples of what I thought were bad backgrounds. And, and I hate those images. There's nothing like a, a nice, smooth background on, on an image, in, in my opinion. I, I'm sorry, Jack. So if you could reiterate when you... Uh consider backgrounds for your um, bird photography. What is it that you look for and what is it that you consider a bad background? Well, a bad background would be uh, anything close to the subject. Uh, if you don't have, if you don't have good uh, bokeh, then, then you got a bad background. If you have other subjects in there, I'll, I'll give me an example. I did a, uh, I did a photo contest and there was a photographer that took some beautiful pictures of ladies in bathing bikinis on the beach. And his lighting was good. The subjects were fabulous. But I came from a, a, a background where we designed ships, a, na a naval architect. And out on the horizon of one of these images, there was one of the FFGs out of Mayport. And I'm looking out there, so my eye was immediately drawn from the subject to the ship out on the horizon. And I looked at that and I thought, why would you leave that in there? Uh, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm like one of those guys. I mean, because I was in shipbuilding, my eye went immediately away from the subject. So any, like when you're taking pictures of people, uh, any other people in the photo that, that you may look at that takes your, takes your eye away from the subject. A, a bad background has distractions in it. And one of those distractions might be the, the horizon running right through the subject's head or you know, a tree jumping in and looking like it's gonna, gonna hurt the person. I mean, it's, it's just, I guess, distractions and a bad background. And in a lot of cases, like that bird I was showing to the woodpecker, the palm fronds were so close to the bird that they were almost in focus and it's hard to separate the background from the subject. So I considered that to be a bad background. There's ways of fixing it. If you have to, you know, you can, you, if you want to really go into Photoshop and, and cut the photo, cut your uh, subject out and set them on a different layer and play with the background, you can do that. And sometimes I do it. If, if my subject is so good and the background is so bad, I'll work on it and make the picture better. Okay, thank you. So now on your um, bird photography, I mean, your book is always awesome. Is there a particular um, aperture that you use for the most part when you're doing these images? Well, naturally I use the lowest f-stop possible. And if I'm shooting a bird, if a bird is, and I, I hate to just keep using that, but I shoot so many birds, but if the bird is, on a perch and he's gonna be standing a, a thwart ship or a cross instead of from front to back, I'm gonna be able to use 2.8 or, or go up to uh, F4. And I know I'm gonna get the whole bird in, in focus, but I wanna get, I wanna use the lowest F-stop possible naturally because you want the highest shutter speed you can get with, with the lowest ISO. So I'm using the lowest F-stop possible, but you always have to make sure that your F stop is is uh high enough to where you're going to get your entire subject in focus from front to back 
when I'm taking pictures of, of models, you're looking at a face and you, you got to make sure if you're, if you're, I focus on the eye, but I want them to make sure I get the tip of the nose in focus. So I'm usually for a model photography, I'm usually uh, always around F4 because I want to get the entire face and subject. Um, so I guess, I guess I'm saying using the lowest uh, f-stop possible gives you your best chance for uh, uh, you know, a clearer background or a blurrier background. I like the blurry background. Uh, perfect. Thank you, Jack. Roll image. Got distractions in there. Got rid of the distractions. Got this Got this eagle in the tree. I don't like those pine cones up there. Got rid of the pine cones. So working on backgrounds is important. And I, 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 I find it really important. Rule of thirds naturally for composition. I'm always looking at composition. I very rarely uh, compose images, except if I'm doing landscapes. If I'm doing wildlife, I'm, I'm, focusing, on the, uh, I'm focusing on the bird or the subject, and I compose afterwards in post-processing. Which means that I'm not getting in so close, I'm so full frame that I don't have room to crop to compose, but I crop to compose just about every image that I take. That's pretty hard to compose right there. Hmm. Landscapes, you have foreground, subject, background. And then the last ingredient is conditions. And conditions can be just about anything. It's really awful when you're in a position where you've got a great subject and you're, you're out in the forest and you forgot bug spray and you have nothing but mosquitoes all over you. You might as well just call it a day. So being prepared, worrying about conditions. If you're doing floral photography and, you, and it's windy, if you're outside, you need to, you need to set up for, to, to block the wind. All these different things, all these conditions, it's all part of something you need to be prepared for. So again, the five ingredients, in my opinion, lighting subject, background, composition, and conditions. Now to the action part of this presentation is birds in flight is action. Birds in flight, some of the best lenses out there are the F4 lenses because they're not so big. The 300 f/4 and the 400 f/4 lenses, they're they're really good because normally you're shooting up in the air, and your lighting is always good. So an f an f/4 lens is adequate, and they're very light and easy to handle. So a lot of people that do uh, bird in flight do really well with uh, a 400 or a 300 f/4 lens. I'm poor, so I only have one lens, <laughs> so I have to use the 300 28. In this case, it's an ISO Lord, six fucking cabin in Maine. <laughs> He's poor because he spent all his money on keep his wife happy. Uh, Jack, I have a question that came in. Uh, on the okay. uh, here on the chat, I just wanted to um, reiterate. Uh, it was when you've taken photo into Topaz and it sometimes becomes too sharp, you use clean. Where is that in Photoshop or Topaz? Uh, in Topaz, they have a uh, now, I don't know if they still have it with their new studio uh, and all their new AI. Uh, uh, programs all my stuff is pretty old i'm using lightroom i'm i'm using lightroom uh i don't know which version it is but 
I send everything into Photoshop Elements 6. It's about 20 years old. And I, with the new computer, I have Elements 12 or 13 on it, and I hate it. I use my, my, big, uh, my big computer, and I use Element 6, and I have Topaz plugins that are probably 12 or 15 years old. So I'm not sure that Clean is even available at this, at this point, but it was a, a, I'd have to go and look. I can't answer that question, but that was a particular plugin that they had before. Uh, exactly. And I use it. Okay. I think they have, have replaced those with two very neat programs, uh, neat plugins called uh, AI Sharpen and AI Noise, Denoise. So the particular clean one that you reference isn't available. Uh, and if you, so if you go online, if you want to sharpen, use the AI uh, Topaz Sharpen. But if you want to denoise, um, they're, and they're just amazing. So for about 80 bucks or 90 bucks, you should buy those two plugins. Okay. So what you're saying, Sean, is that's probably the equivalent of the clean then? Yes. So. Okay. Yes. yes. I, don't, I don't know. I mean, I have sharpen and I have denoise. And it, clean, it, it, I don't know. I'd have, I'd have to research that. But uh, I have AI sharpen and uh, denoise, and I use those two. Yeah, yeah. Do you have the new ones, Jack? The, the, no, I don't have the new ones. The new one. Yeah. The new one clean is still out here. It's twenty nine ninety nine. They've got oh, it okay. still out. It's a separate um, feature, a separate app, a, a separate app that you can buy. Topaz. Okay. okay. I Thanks like that. When it, it says does a really, what do they? Yeah. It does a really good job of cleaning up an image and taking the taking the sharp edges off of of your subject well well it must be awesome because your your pictures are just amazing jack thanks okay i'll do it i'll do it i told you to contact her i told her to contact you i can't do more than that that's fine i'll do it but also uh, not just not just, just let uh, me do this one for, program. I like to do uh, sports, surfing, wow. stuff like that. So I want to show you some examples of other action images. Awesome. Now, you you can't use uh, my camera to take golf pictures anymore. I mean, if I if I was shooting Tiger Woods as he's as he's teeing off, he he would come after me with his golf club. He doesn't want to hear the clicking of the noise. With the new R5, you can shoot all the time, and you don't have to worry about a golfer being upset with you because he hears the click of your camera. So it was always these types of shots that I would get. But these would be considered action shots. I go out and I practice at Little League games. And it's kind of interesting and it's fun. In this particular case, I was hired to take a picture of the woman's, of, the, of her son who was pitching. And I took a lot of uh, shots of him pitching. But once uh, he was taken out of the game, I went around to center field and I set my camera up on the fence and I was getting pictures of the batters. And uh, it turned out pretty cool. <laughs> I go into the woods a lot, and I often think about carrying pepper spray, carrying a tripod, uh, and maybe even carrying a weapon. And I've carried a weapon a, a few times, but it's it's not something that I would ever ever even want to carry or to, to use. Uh, so pepper spray is probably the best thing. Uh, but I've been in positions where I had no no contact through my phone. I'm so far out there that. And I got into trouble a couple times, uh, and I realized that I couldn't even call anybody. If I was injured, I wouldn't even be able to call. So keeping communication lines open, it, you know, in 
in Maine, cell phones only go so far. So I try to avoid that. And there's been a couple of times where I've had to use my tripod as a weapon. And it's, uh, that's probably your best bet. Uh, if you have a tripod, you want to hold it up, you want to try to uh, protect yourself from a, a moose or a bear or something like that. I had, I had this guy come after me, chased me around a little bit, got on the other, around my car and I held my tripod up hoping that he wouldn't charge me again. And he finally turned around and went back into the woods. But this was, I don't think he liked me taking this shot. He was standing there, we were eye to eye. We both ended up on the same path coming towards each other and we both stopped. He looked at me, I looked at him. I said, okay. So I raised my camera and I clicked it and he started after me. So uh, it's just another bad example. It's just another example of bad lighting. But uh, this was the last shot I got of this little, this young bull who was probably 500 pounds chasing me around, around in the forest. Lighting was at least your problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. I'm always trying to get a subject doing something different. Everybody's taking pictures of birds. You got to get, you got to get something special. The, the feathers being raised up. This owl looking at his, at his, his brother, wondering, you know, excuse me. They don't like to share, they don't like to share treetops. Moose isn't real happy with my being there either. He's giving me a lip roll, and that's that's sort of a a warning to get out. And I went ahead and left. Getting as close as you can get is important, obviously, for detail and sharpness. You'll remember this one, Sean. Oh, yes, I do. <laughs> Sean and I were together in the forest up there in Baxter State Park. When we finally came, we were looking for moose all day, and we finally had word that there was a moose down the road, and we, we were able to get in close with him. I love it when subjects look at you. I mean, I, I love... I just absolutely find it fascinating when an owl or an eagle or any bird, any animal, actually, you make eye contact and they, you just have to wonder what they're thinking. This one had my heart beating pretty well. I knew I was, I knew I was going to make it pretty close to the truck, but he came really close to us. And uh, he stood there for a few minutes and sort of eyed us up. And uh, I had about 30 feet to run to get into the truck. So I knew I was, I figured I'd make it. I was safe, but I got a pretty good shot of this bear. Like again, again, eye contact. You just have to wonder what they're thinking. Emotion also. That's my presentation. I'd like to hear some questions. Have you got room on your uh, drive up at tonight? Oh, so Jack, uh, on these. Uh, Jack, what are you using to sharpen your your images? What features are you using to sharpen with? I I don't sharpen. 
I don't sharpen my images. He doesn't sharpen his images. I, I don't know. I can say that I've, I can't remember the last time I sharpened, actually sharpened an image. I'm usually sort of turn, toning them down a little bit. Um, they look sharp. Well, they're sharp. They're, they're sharper. They're, they, or, they're, or they're not a five, right, Sean? <laughs> yeah. So but, it's, but, uh, it, but, it has but you to be, do, it has, but you used uh, topaz uh, clear or uh, so you sharpen them with. Yes, topaz clean. I use topaz clean to take the uh, sharp edge off a little bit. Uh, and it, it tends to give you a, a really nice image. It doesn't really, uh, it doesn't take the sharpness away. It just takes the edge off. I, it's hard to explain if, if you, if you can go on there and use clean, uh, and I only use it to uh, the, uh, I bring the slider all the way over to zero. And it just gives me a little bit of a, of a nice presentation. And it, it looks better than, than extra sharp. And uh, only on rare occasions, if I get a, an image that is really, really good, but the distance is kind of far away, I may, try to uh, I'll put the subject on a separate layer and sharpen that layer and then uh, denoise the background. And that's another thing I can say. A lot of times uh, I'll take the, in Topaz, I'll use the program and I'll separate the subject from the background and I'll denoise the background. And sometimes, and I was telling you this, Gene, one time, that once I get the background separated from the subject, I'll run the slider on denoise all the way over to uh, 80, an 85, all the way to the right. And not only does it denoise, it also gives you a little bit of blur. So it helps to uh, separate the subject with a little bit of blur on the background. So I'll use the noise sometimes to enhance the, uh, the blur in the background. But I always separate, naturally, I always separate the subject out uh, first. Hey, Jack. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm always impressed with your eagles in flight shots. And um, so, you know, I, it's same with surfing. I do a lot of surfing photography, so it's very similar. But as far as the auto selection, AF. Thank you, Thank do you, you Jack. Do, do, you, do you know which, I mean, I look at your settings because you always put your settings in there, which is great. Um, but as far as how do you, how do you pick your, your, your focus button, um, your focus selection, do you use auto selection AF? Do you know? So that you got, oh, no, huh? no, I only use two, I only use two selections when I'm shooting and I'll use a center point or five points. And it's, oh. uh, I'll use center point when I'm, uh, for subjects that I can, that'll be still, uh, I'll use that so that I can focus on the eye. Right. Uh, if, uh, if I'm doing surfing uh, pictures, I'm going to be using the, the four or five points so oh. that I can get close because you're not going to be able to, to really get in on the eye. And birds in flight also, I use like a five point setting. Wow. And, and hope to get, uh, you know, the, the bird sharp. Now, I don't always, you know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right. But, you know, you know. <laughs> Sean knows you, you dump a lot of pictures sometimes, you know, you get yeah. some good ones and, and, you know, good thing we're not shooting film, but uh, now I'll use the, the center point or, or I'll expand it out uh, four extra center and four outer points. And I'll expand it out for birds in flight or any, any action shot that I think I have to get where I'm, I don't think I'm good enough to uh, use the center point for, for the subject. Right. Okay. Thanks, Jack. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Did you have a question, Helen? Okay. Have you seen other? I, oh. I have one. You said, believe it or not, I couldn't type fast enough. So your five ingredients to a great photo are lighting, subject, composition, and what were the other two? Uh, and I think it's, it's really, I think in this order for me, and it's my opinion, lighting, subject, background, composition, and conditions. Yeah. 
those are the five main ingredients, uh, in my opinion, that are so important to a good photo. And I look, whenever I'm processing or looking at something, I think about each one of those. Well, it's not so much conditions because that's already over. But, uh, you know, the, the lighting subject, background, and composition are, are so important. Because you know, if you're critiquing other people's work, you can look at those five ingredients and you can say, well, yeah, he's got them all or he's, he, he, he's not so hot on this or that. And that way, if you're ever hired to have to uh, critique other people's work or do competitions, you wanna be able to uh, use those uh, ingredients as a scale. You can say, well, that picture really looks good, but this is bad and that's bad. And you can take points off and that way when you're doing a competition, that's one way that a judge can separate uh, one image that initially looks good uh, from another image that also initially looks good. But after you look a little bit closer at them and you start to, to pick them apart some, you'll be able to uh, choose an image that you think is, is better quality overall. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Have you seen any hummingbirds this year yet? I haven't seen any hummingbirds this year. I usually see them outside. I don't, I'm not set up to uh, photograph hummingbirds here okay. in Atlantic Beach because I have so many of them in Maine. Uh, they're just all over the place. They're like bugs up there. So, uh, <laughs> and, I see, and it's, and they're, they're only the ruby throats. Uh, I wish I was in. Uh, Texas or you know Mexico where we can get several different varieties of hummingbirds but unfortunately here on the east coast and all the way up the coast the only hummingbirds we see are the ruby throats and they're nice and uh, I've gotten some really nice shots of them I had a whole section uh, in my presentation on hummingbird photography that I took out because I thought it was going to be a little long so uh, but yeah uh, when I'm in Maine I, I photograph hummingbirds but not here. Oh. So, Jack, which ones do you get in New Mexico? Well, there's probably 50 different varieties. Uh, and I, I've never been there to get them, so I can't say. I've seen other people's work, all the different types of hummingbirds. And, and uh, I have a, a good friend, Barry Mansell, who has gone to Mexico and gone to South Texas uh, to photograph, specifically to photograph hummingbirds. And there are several different varieties, but unfortunately, we only get the ruby throat hummingbird here on the East Coast. It's a beautiful hummingbird, but it's the only one. And you have the male that looks great, the female not as great, but uh, yeah. And we have thousands of them up in Maine. I, I set out a hummingbird feeder. In fact, I have a couple of them set out because some of the males get really aggressive and territorial so I, I have hummingbird feeders all around so that they can't be territorial on one particular feeder and I'm filling them up sometimes every other or every third day they're emptied out so uh, wow. I feed a lot of hummingbirds up in Maine. It's fun to see when the babies come out the the hummingbird the, the only time they're not aggressive when you see two or three hummingbirds together, it's usually a mother and a father and, and the youngster. And that's, that's, that's so special to see the parents bring a, a, a baby to a, your hummingbird feeder. And I always mount the hummingbird feeders over our flowers and we, we always plant a lot of uh, hummingbird flowers uh, so that they'll go down and they'll be on the uh, flowers too. So that's, that's a lot of fun. Anyone else? Yes, Jack, I have a question. You had sure. said you positioned the bird. You were talking about the position of the bird when you can get the whole thing in focus at 2.8. Was that with the bird um, long way or facing you? Oh, if, he's, if he's facing me, if he's facing me at 2.8, the tail's gonna be soft. Okay. Because I'm focusing on the face. And, and, I, and some of those uh, pictures that uh, I showed Oh, I lost you. You froze. In some cases, the tails were soft. Okay. okay. I don't know if it's my internet or yours. Yeah. Oh, it's mine. It just said your internet connection is unstable. I have no idea why. But uh, on if, if I'm getting, I usually try to be around F4. If I'm so okay. close to them, 
I have to usually be around F4. And if I'm at F4, a small bird will be in focus front to back. Okay. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? You got room on your property up there for a small RV, Jack? <laughs> <laughs> What's plugging? Yeah, I do. I do. I have a... <laughs> I'll, I'll be I have a couple. I have a couple properties up there that are on the lake. In fact, uh, we sold our cabin this fall, so we're not. We have no place to go to up there except for a vacant property, a vacant adjacent property, oh. and there's no septic or well, so that has to be done. And uh, we're talking about we're thinking about building up there. So we're not really sure what we're going to do this, this uh, summer. We may be in Florida a little bit longer, but uh, with the price was, of wood right now, I was it's thinking just so building and half is unbelievable. So we've actually thought about putting a, a pad up there and a septic tank. I got electric all there and a well and buying a, uh, a fifth wheel and putting the fifth wheel up there. Now we've looked at some fifth wheels that are pretty darn nice. You know, like eighty thousand gets you into a, a forty-two footer. Oh, it'll get and, you. Uh, it, it'll get you into a palace. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're pretty nice. Oh, you can. My get, wife and I have been looking, going around looking at them, and, and we're actually, we're actually considering it. Where we and the reason is, we thought, well, we're going to put a trailer uh, on the property first, and then we'll live in that while we build our house. Because I wanted, to, I wanted to be hands-on. I wanted to be part of, of building our our new camp. And, uh, but then I started thinking also, my God, these are so nice. Maybe I don't want to build a house. Maybe I want to just stay in, <laughs> stay in a trailer and well, pack it up in the, pack it up in the fall, drain, yeah. drain all the, drain it and leave it. I mean, I'm not going to throw it anywhere. Let me tell you. I mean, my, I'm, Subaru, I'm, my Subaru isn't going to carry a fifth wheel anywhere. So uh, <laughs> if we, if we buy it, and I talked to the guy over, uh, over by the airport, it was, uh, Gore, Gore, whatever they used to be, they're camping world now. And uh, I said, okay, well, I'll buy this thing. And he says, well, we'll deliver it. I said, well, okay, Clifton, Maine, that's where you need to deliver it. He said, well, we're not going to deliver it. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me, let me tell you, Jack, give me a call because, and I'll tell you why very simply, I'm, I have an RV, right? I've changed to a smaller one, so I don't need a big one, obviously, on my own, but the market last year went berserk. Everybody was buying RVs, fifth wheels, trailers, the whole thing. And now you're going to see them all coming back on the market because they're going to say, ooh, that's not for me. So there's going to be some real deals around if you just stop it right. We've looked at a few yeah. used ones. It's just, I just, uh, I don't know. I, I just don't want to use one, I guess. I don't, I don't know. Uh, we're looking at because I don't think we'll be able to find what we want. We like the Van Lea Volano, and it has a couple steps up into a, a, a an area like a family room where you can sit and entertain. Uh, it's important because we do a lot of entertaining, and we we want to be able to have an area where we can entertain. Now, like I said, well, a lot of times when we entertain uh, in Maine, we we're entertaining at, on a dock or at the picnic table adjacent to the water, and not in the house at all. So I don't know. A lot of a lot of things to think about, but it's uh, we're. I think if we get one, we're gonna we're gonna go for something that really that we really like the layout. The layout's important to us. Oh yeah, and there's so many to choose from. And the mechanics but of it. But you can't have a fireplace. Yes, you, you can. <laughs> they have yeah, fireplaces. Really? They have these little, that... Yeah, they have not a real one, but they have these the, the heaters that they have in there is this fake fireplace and you know the more i look at them i said yeah that's kind of nice and sit there with a glass of wine and have this fire going you know but it, it does emit heat and you know sometimes in the fall even in the spring you know you'll, you'll get a cold uh, snap mm -hmm. and it can get down in the 30s you know in august so it's like well right. Right. sometimes it's nice to have a little bit of heat i mean th the heater in our camp ran we ran it a lot we ran all propane and uh you know that heater that heater came on plenty of times i don't know how many times my wife would say can we just take the chill off a little bit i said yeah but 
we like having a wood burning stove and that's the one thing you can't have in, a, in an RV is a wood burning stove. That's really nice heat. And, and, you can get and in Maine, we have an abundance of wood that yeah. would be, so Wait, I don't know. We're, we're not sure what we're going to do right now. And, uh, uh, so we're so it's sort of up in the air. So I may be in I may be in Florida to go to the to that uh, July outing or some of those where I've never been able to uh, go to any summer outings here at all. Well, Jack, that's a that's a wonderful dilemma for you to be in. So that's awesome. <laughs> it's going to get so hot here that we're going to be thinking about Maine. We probably might just end up driving up there and doing something. Something better than a tent, but I, we may just end up going up there. But it was yeah. so it was so hot last summer up there. I mean, we didn't have air conditioning, and it was so hot in Maine last year that we actually talked about coming back to Florida, where we would be able to be in our house with air conditioning. It's when it gets so hot, the only thing you can do is get in a car and drive out to the, the island and go out to the coast, where if it's eighty-five or ninety inland you get that out to mount desert island and it's like 65 and foggy it's it's amazing how the weather changes when you you well, drive to the coast because the ocean temperature is always cold yeah. so well, you, you always have a, a relief by going to the ocean but uh i don't know we'll see jack, if we if we build up there we're going to have air conditioning now jack you don't have yeah. to be there just tell me what the address is i got air conditioning in the rv i'll be fine <laughs> it's 15 parks pond lane clifton maine 04428 <laughs> i hope you're quick enough to get it because i'm not going to repeat it that's okay it's on video uh, we, we, it's on recorded it's been oh, recorded no problem i'll get it from jerry <laughs> <laughs> any other questions no. i hope you guys enjoyed this great job yeah Jack, great job. Fantastic. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Jack. That was wonderful. Yeah. Thank you, Jack, so much. Great yeah. pictures, great information. Everything. Yeah. If anybody has any other questions that you think about, you can always email me or send me a text. I'm, I'd be glad. Join it immensely. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jack. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.